this is the, su uh, the analyst super panel, as you can see. And the objective of this panel is really to provide uh, all of us with a broad overview of some of the most resonant themes in the industry at this point in time. And these are themes that over the next four days, with additional panels and with additional discussions, you'll hear a lot more of deep diving into. Uh, and there's, there's no one more qualified than the panel on stage right now, uh, some of the best analysts in the business, to try and give us a ringside view into what are the biggest trends, what are the biggest opportunities, and indeed, what are the biggest threats that are facing our industry today. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen. We have Ed Barton, who is a partner at OM. Uh, we have Craig Johnson, MD Media at Nielsen. Uh, we have someone uh, who a lot of the people in this room are very familiar with. We have Nick Buffett, MD APAC Kantar. We have Ashish Ferwani from Ernst & Young uh, from Mumbai. Uh, and we have Ben Keen, who's a chief analyst at IHS. So welcome, gentlemen. Uh, it's, it's both a pleasure and a privilege to have all of you on stage here. So let's, let's dive right in uh, with something that I think we were discussing uh, backstage a short while ago, and which has been a matter of a lot of conversation, uh, which is really telcos and the role that uh, telcos has really started playing in the content ecosystem. Uh, now, with more and more telcos looking at offering content, not just as a differentiator, but also as a means of strengthening their own product proposition with triple play, with data, with voice bundled in, uh, the question really is, are telcos really the new affiliates? Are they the new pay TV operators? Uh, and if so, what are the real implications both for traditional pay TV operators as well as for broadcasters? Ben? Sure. Well, you, you know, I'm not sure that, um, uh, that the word telco, you know, is, is even going to have that much meaning going forward. You know, in terms of definitions, you know, all of these companies are, are operators offering multiple services. You know, so AT&T, great example. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the largest quote-unquote telcos in this world, you know, made a very aggressive move into pay TV with the acquisition of, of Direct TV. Uh, now becoming even more aggressive by trying to buy a, a, a studio. We'll see if Trump lets, uh, lets them do that. <laughs> so what, is it, what does it become? I don't think it, you know, telco is a meaningful definition for it any longer. Um, you know, it's trying to, to offer uh, uh, multiple services, multiple forms of engagement, uh, and I think that's going to be a model that, you know, all operators will, will follow going forward. You know, similarly, Liberty Global, world's largest cable TV operator outside the United States. Is it a cable TV operator? Or, or is it something more because they're moving aggressively into, into mobile where they can? So, you know, the definitions are blurring, uh, and, you know, I think they're all just, just operators. I kind of resonate with that because uh, I think the way broadcasters need to look at it is that the telcos have a certain customer base, and they're just one more affiliate channel as far as they're concerned. Uh, and therefore, they should partner and optimize the customers that the telco is able to bring to their content because that's really the core competency of the broadcasters and the content guys to produce great content. If the customer is viewing it through satellite or through terrestrial or through a telco, that really shouldn't matter. It's all about maximizing revenue. The only other thing is that the way that content is consumed when it comes to a telco is something that content providers need to be wary of. It's no longer a 30 minute or a 60 minute slot. It could be much shorter. That really depends on the size of the screen that we're talking about. Uh, but that's certainly something that if a broadcaster, if a content company wants to optimize, they're going to have to start looking beyond the 30 and 60 minute stuff when they're thinking about telcos and optimizing the reach that telcos can provide to them. Yeah, and, and with what both of you said, the central theme that seems to again resonate is that uh, it's no longer just one standalone service. It really needs to be a bundle. It needs to be larger. It needs to be a much larger value proposition than what it used to be. Uh, is that something that, that, that I resonates mean, with you, Ed? I mean, yeah. I mean, we very much, um, I think at Oven, we very much look at television within the context of the multiplay bundle. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you're very interested in how telcos are using TV. Uh, and entertainment to drive the value of some of their other bundle services as well. You know, we think that's an incredibly interesting situation. Um, I think if we go further and we think about actually the presence of telcos as a more meaningful uh, customer for many of the content rights uh, auctions currently going on around the world, you know, we see um, <laughs> some very interesting moves there. I mean, particularly BT Sport making a very, very large bet 
on uh, premiership football, which is effectively a lost leader for leadership of the high-speed broadband market in the UK. So it's a much, much more complex and fluid situation than just looking at pay TV subscriptions. We need to look at it in the overall context of the managed services proposition into the household in general. Yeah, from, um, from my point of view, the, the pay TV providers that are integrated back with the telco, and I think Starhub is a great example here in Singapore where it has assets across both telco uh, and pay TV, has done, has done very well because you have specialists in the company that understand the entertainment business and also the telco business. I think where it doesn't work so well is when you get a telco that goes out of and buys a big sporting package just to try to sort of push their push their broadband, uh, move people across onto their onto their bundles, and this is just um, this is not working. Leaves a bad taste for the consumer because they're forced into this. And if you want to see this various this certain sport, you have to change providers. I think as we move forward, telcos will start to question. Do they really want to be in the entertainment business and start to look back to see the assets they have? Uh, at Nielsen, we're starting to work with a lot of telcos around their rich data sets. Um, they have so much tracking data. They have, um, with their location data, there is a lot of measurement that can be derived from this. So I think they're finding other ways to monetize rather than going into entertainment and becoming pay TV operators. So you don't think it's work for BT then, investing in sport? Uh, I can't I can't comment on the BT example, um, but you just look, said it didn't work for telcos okay. to do that. And we I think go, they I'll, think it's worked pretty I well. I will talk about the Australian example of the EPL, uh, the EPL um, being forced onto a telco in Australia. Um, if you want, um, if you wanted to see it, yeah. is um, I don't think it's worked. Right. Um, BT may because it's got a longer history of going in and buying sporting rights uh, and doing this type of work, but I think from a from a short-term point of view, um, no. I mean, I th you asked a question about um, content, and we have a phrase, we call it from TV to TV. Okay. It's the transition that's going on, and the old TV was television, and the new TV is total video. So, um, so all of these platforms, whether they're legacy telcos or they're legacy pay TV operators, they all have to be in the space of being able to offer total video content so people can watch it when they want to watch it, where they want to watch it, and all that sort of and, stuff. And, and that's, that's a great segue, actually, into my next question, which, which uh, I'd love for you to answer, Nick, specifically regarding consumer behavior. So there's a lot of talk about uh, video across platforms, across mobiles, across multiple screens, OTT itself, which is being touted as uh, really the next thing. It's the future of pay TV. But what's consumer behavior really telling us? What, what's happening in terms of pure data as far as audience consumption goes? Is that consumption really going up? What kind of content is it? Uh, is traditional TV, especially in this part of the world, starting to go down? So what are really your learnings from across <coughs> markets that you've looked at? I think in broad terms, our learnings are that actually what you might call traditional TV content is still pretty robust. Live viewing still takes up the, the majority share of total TV minutes. Some of that is now being time shifted, but um, um, but typical time shifting maybe adds five to ten percent to a piece of content. Yes, absolutely, viewing is changing, but not at the speed or the hype. I, I, personally, I don't believe the hype that's going on around some of this changing consumer behaviour. It's not happening as fast as some of the newer players would like you to think. Okay, and, and are there reasons for that? Is it really an issue on, uh, on technology? Is it an issue on availability? Is broadband the issue? Do you see that changing going forward? Um, yeah, broadband availability in some markets is, is maybe holding that la back a little bit. But I think you get into this argument about what is TV viewing? Is it lean back or lean forward and that sort of stuff? I think a lot of TV viewing is still lean back. You know, I want to be entertained and I, I want to watch it, and it as it's happening. And it's, from a, it's a mixed picture, right? So, yes, in, in the, the leading markets around the world, you know, Live linear television is still dominant. So US, UK, 80% of viewing is still live linear. Cool. Television on demand you know, is growing fast, but it's growing very fast amongst particular demographics. So younger demographics, you know, they're, they're much less reliant on live linear television. But you, know, you have got dramatic growth going on of new video platforms. And it's not just about traditional TV. You know, look at the explosive growth of video 
on Facebook, on Snapchat. Both Facebook and Snapchat now rival YouTube in global delivery of video consumption. That's a staggering change. True. We're seeing dramatic behavioral changes going on while some of the headline numbers you know, look, look kind of robust, stable. We must uh, you know, look underneath that. And yeah, and I think from, uh, from using the U.S. example, because we have the, probably the most robust measurement in the U.S., uh, there, is, there is still a lot of hype. Uh, the explosion is happening, but the explosion is happening in this 5, five to 6% range. Uh, we are still seeing, I know a lot of people in the room will just groan, traditional TV is still alive and well, and I think things like sports rights, news, are very much driving traditional TV. We are seeing, though, an explosion of these online services, OTT, Snapchat, Facebook, mm -hmm. but they are still a very small part of the infrastructure. And I think also advertisers still haven't completely worked out how to monetize mm -hmm. and how to put their commercials into these, these formats. So once this happens, I'm sure we'll see an acceleration of money being spent onto these platforms, but at the moment there is still probably more hype than actual people watching. I mean, I think also that these, um, these consumption habits skew towards sharply younger demographics, mm -hmm. and that's the scary thing for the rest of the industry. And, uh, you know, at a lot of these events, I think we all try and work out, so what's going to happen when these younger audiences for whom short-form online video, social video consumption is at its highest, when they, when they grow up, when they get their own place, are, they, are their habits going to change back to something looking vaguely like ours? And so, I know, I honestly think that... Um, I honestly think no one knows the answer to that, and that's, that's the slightly scary thing. If, if anyone does know the answer to that, then um, you know, let's go and play the lottery numbers tonight, aren't they? <laughs> Every, everyone's sitting back to watch that uh, first millennial grow up. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, linked to that, I think one other point when it comes to millennials is really the total cost of the experience. Because I think what we're seeing is it's, it's great for an ODT player to come in and say, here's a $5 pack or an $8 pack. But when the broadband cost gets added on to that, and in some markets it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. So in India, there's a broadband cost that comes in at another $25 or so. So it becomes like a $30, $33 thing. And then when I compare that to linear television, mm -hmm. which is priced at $4, it just becomes such a steep increase in cost sure. to move towards OTT. And therefore, I think that's for a millennial audience, which is the one that's taken to all the video watching online. The earning power is a lot less than the other elder audiences. Sure. So that's something that needs to be factored yeah. in market by market. Yeah. And, and that's also where it comes back to your initial question about the, the operator, because the operator has, has the power in the situation if it is a multiplay operator to, to, to leverage the bundle to do that. But, you know, we see time and time again that they're not doing it effectively. You know, if you look at the U.S. market, it's no surprise that we're seeing cord cutting when we're seeing the price of a triple play package being $35 yeah. more than it is to take a broadband only plus two or three over the top yeah. services, yeah. right? So there's that margin there, uh, you know, opening up and saying, you know, cut my cord, please. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, th that's interesting. And, and what Ashish was saying earlier, uh, there's something that's happening in India which is moving exactly in the opposite direction, right? Which seems to be, at least on the face of it, designed to take care of this particular issue. And I'm talking about the launch of Geo, uh, which, is, which is promising and it's looking like it's starting to deliver incredible uh, mobile broadband speeds for that market, real-time speeds of 12 to 15 Mbps uh, at a fraction of the cost that, uh, that any of the other players are offering. And at a all you can consume content, right, with no additional data charges. Do you see that as a big game changer in the country? Do you see that as something that's going to really change the way television or content is consumed? So I think the basic fundamental of bundling content with broadband is of prime importance if you want to see an uptake of broadband in any country uh, in the world today. I think that, that goes without saying because just the cost of consuming a good monthly OTT subscription is four to five times the cost of that subscription today. If you really want to sit down and actually match hours on spent on TV with hours spent on online, uh, the, the cost is prohibitive in most cases. And therefore, yes, anything that brings the cost down, I think will have a very positive impact. Having said that, there is also the question, and a very important question, of a customer's propensity to pay. 
unfortunately, I think most uh, OTT services, except for a few, start off as free services. And I believe it's extremely difficult to get someone used to a free service to then start paying. So you're gonna either work the freemium model or you're gonna struggle for the next 10 years to get your rates up uh, to make it work. Geo will definitely have a positive impact, but again, as of right now, it's free. Let's see how that scales up once the pricing starts. Uh, so from a broadcaster standpoint, to, to pivot a little and look at it from a content producer standpoint, so there's a bit of a selfish question. I'm, I'm really interested in knowing uh, what you guys think and what's the direction that someone like uh, like us, for example, a content producer really needs to be taking. Uh, on, on the one hand, there is there is the whole long format content, the Netflix model, the aggregator model in the OTT space, which says that, okay, here's, here's some of the most premium content and we aggregate it and we charge a price for it. On the other hand, to what Ben was saying, there is an insane amount of short form video consumption that is, that is happening on social media, that's happening on Snapchat, that's happening on Facebook. So as a content producer, as a traditional content producer, if you, if one wanted to be in the space and actually look at saying that, okay, let's equip ourselves, let's start producing for the future, what's really the direction to take? I, you know, I think it's a boom time for content creation now, globally. You know, the, the amount of investment going into both the high end, mm -hmm. which you, you talked about in the context of Netflix, but also, you know, so-called digital first content creation, that's also, you know, a, a, a boom time. You know, so um, it's good for content creation. I mean, you know, Netflix, um, you know, is is becoming the kind of model here in terms of the focus on original exclusive content. This year, they will have produced 30 original content series. Next year, it'll be double that. This year, uh, you know, they, they spent six billion dollars on content. Next year, it'll be seven billion. These are staggering numbers that the industry has never seen before. They're pouring it into mostly very, very high-end content. But again, you know, we're seeing um, uh, interesting stuff happen on multi-channel networks across the, the, the digital aggregators like YouTube, like, like Facebook and, and increasingly other platforms. So both ends of the equation, interesting stuff happening, interesting opportunities. And I think the, um, what, what we're seeing is, say, for uh, companies like Red Bull Production, they started off with very much short form, and now they're actually doing feature-length films. So I think it's very much um, companies being able to take the, the, um, the long form and bring it back into usable chunks. Um, reality programs like The Block and The Bachelor that we've seen in Australia have been very good at chunking these down for mobile consumption, uh, for people to catch up the next morning on the train, or at work rather than seeing the full episode. So I think there is there are cases where the short form producer has taken it long and the long form producer has brought it back into something short and repackaged the product. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with Ben. It is a great time to be a content creator, especially the high end. There are seemingly more competitors to license your content. But I also think it's like a relatively challenging time. I mean, the relatively fluid situation around release windows in each country and the obligation to try to maximize your potential in each of those and the huge explosion in platforms um, to actually present the content on as well as content formats. I think, you know, the temptation for a content creator is I have to have a stake in all of these markets. And this is a very, very challenging um, task to set oneself. And you know, I think, you know, it comes back to just good old fashioned basics, really, you know, know your audience. Um, and, and produce great shows which, which appeal to them. I think that the, the difficulty is now, yeah, a lot easy. of content creators yeah. now think I've got to become a distribution effort, expert, I've got to become a platform, I've got to become a technologist. So it's very, very, it, you know, I just think keep your eyes on the main prize, keep your eye on the, on the core skill set of content creators, which is making great shows. So you're right, it can become much more complicated that all those distribution economics can become much more complicated, but they can also be much simpler. So, you know, back in the old days, I, I, you know, you would have to go around the world and do, do multiple, you know, uh, pre-production deals. You get co-productions with, you know, maybe a dozen different broadcasters around the world for a major, major series. You know, now you can get paid, you know, once by Netflix for a global deal, right? So it's not just more complicated, it can be much simpler if you have the right deal. So, you know, it works both ways. Yeah, yeah. And, and which all ties back to what Ed was saying about having the right content, yeah. right? Yeah. 
It, it's the right content, you know. Yeah. If you've got a great story about the British royal family, then you're, you're in the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> speaking about money, uh, the other real source of revenue for, for most content creators, uh, one, one real part is subscription or, 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 or what you're getting from content sales, and the other real part is advertising, right? And, and a lot has been said, for example, about multi-platform measurement and how multi-platform measurement really needs to be a lot more robust uh, for broadcasters or content creators to be able to really monetize and measure accurately uh, what their actual viewership is, rather than just the viewership of the linear channel. Uh, so Nick, as well as Craig, uh, your thoughts on, is, is that measurement ecosystem robust enough? Are we making enough progress there? Uh, are there markets which, which you think are great examples of how that's been navigated, and, and what's really the way forward on it? So, <clears throat> multi-platform measurement has been around for quite a while, in fact. So, um, an audience measurement has been around for, for a long, long time. Um, so, we've been measuring time shifting uh, and so on for many, many years now. Of course, as viewing has fragmented or the opportunity to view on other platforms has, has changed, then there is a need to, to be able to measure that across all different platforms. So, we run a lot of measurement panels around the world. Um, which do a very good job, very, uh, very robust at measuring what might be called broad channels, broad demographics. Um, and some of the larger pay TV channels are, are quite well served by that. But they're not, they're challenged when it comes to the long tail. No doubt about that. I think everyone would accept that. Um, and the way we're meeting that challenge or the way that challenge can be met is by harnessing other data sets. So we think of things like what we call return path data or set-top box data. So in this part of the world, we work with Astro, for example, to run an RPD service, um, or to bring in online sensors viewing information and, and wrap that around the panel information. And that can, can help to fill in all of the pieces, if you like, or to create this complete picture. We're already doing that in the Netherlands, for example. That's a service that's live, capturing uh, linear TV, time shift, online viewing, including commercials. Um, uh, we've just been awarded a contract in Norway to do that. So, so yeah, there's been a bit of catching up to do in the measurement space, but I think we've actually now got the solutions in place, and it's a case of working in the different markets to bring that to reality. And, and I think the big difference today is um, f five years ago, the, the general rule of thumb was unless there was about 5% of viewing to a platform, you didn't really look at measuring because it wasn't worth, um, it wasn't there, it wasn't worth the, um, the broadcaster monetizing it. But now what we're seeing is there are a lot of different platforms and they're adding up to 10%. Uh, so we may have seven or eight different platforms into that extra 10% viewing which we now need to measure. Uh, I think as Nick said, the, we have the, no one talks about standard television audience measurement panels anymore. They're just a given. I think it's all the extras that we now put on them. Uh, Nielsen uh, has a system called Digital Content Ratings uh, which we're currently piloting Thailand where we go in and work with the broadcaster to put their linear feed and add it back with their streaming feed. And I think one of the most important things with this is, is around uh, deduplication. We really need to make sure that broadcasters, for the, advertising, uh, for the advertisers' sake, are not double counting their audiences. And this is where it starts to get difficult. Previously, we've been able to go into countries and do a measurement without um, actually getting the permission of the broadcaster to do the measurement and being completely independent. But in this new day and age with streaming, um, with needing to introduce uh, SDKs into services, we now need to have much tighter cooperation with the broadcasters in a market to be able to do this. So the measurement is uh, keeping pace now uh, and let's just see what happens in the next 12 to 18 months because there will certainly be a new technology, a new operating system that we're gonna have a challenge to measure. What do you guys think of, um, so two of the key global OTT SVOD platforms, Amazon and Netflix, routinely say to their content creators, we don't, we're not going to tell you what your audience is. We're, we're not into this audience measurement on the conventional. And, it's irrelevant yeah, to us. And, and they may not be, but um, Netflix, uh, Nielsen is doing uh, measurement for, right. uh, doing Netflix for content producers. So okay. the content producers want an independent view of the people that are watching their content. So there being technologies to, developed and this has just pushed us both companies harder to right. measure these services if people say well we're not going to be cooperative 
Well, I think, I think part of the rationale for, or the, the reason that they're not doing that is they don't sell advertising, or Netflix doesn't sell advertising sure. against their content yeah. at the moment. So if you think about why audience measurement happened way back when, it was to fuel the advertising market, to create a common currency by which airtime <coughs> could be traded. Um, and that's still its primary purpose, sure. actually. Um, and Netflix doesn't have that need. If they ever start selling advertising, maybe they'll change then their maybe view. Maybe they'll change. Fair enough. Right. Nick, you mentioned return path data and how you're working with Astro on, on harnessing the return path data. And we're increasingly beginning to see more and more operators trying to set up their own return path data panels. We know that StarHub has a return path data panel here. There are a couple of other broadcasters in the region who are starting to do that. Uh, and, and in some markets, they tend to exist independently of each other, right? Do you really see that as a complement to the regular measurement system? Do you see that as something that, that needs to be worked with? Do you, do you think there's a path to really integrating both? Yeah, I don't think it's an either or, actually. I think um, RPD, or return part data, has, has two big utilities, really. One is what you might call audience measurement, and the other is um, use by the operator for its other business uses. So Astro use it a lot for subscriber management, carriage negotiations, promotion optimization, all that sort of stuff, which is not out, a little bit outside of the audience measurement space. Um, and it makes perfect sense for them to, to utilize that data if they can collect it and process it sure. and whatever. In terms of it feeding into audience measurement, absolutely, we think RPD should be a component of audience measurement going forward. We've actually worked with Nielsen in Malaysia to combine free-to-air TAM data with, with Astro's RPD, so we know it can be done. It requires the consent of the owner of the RPD in order for that to happen. So Astro, in Malaysia's case, Astro are happy for it to happen. It varies a bit around the world as to whether operators are prepared to allow their data to be fed into the industry currency. Sure. And it, it, it also requires quite a lot of um, market education, as uh, Nick and I are finding in Malaysia, to, to go out and educate, ed, educate clients and uh, agencies and brand owners that these can be put together to form robust data sets. Uh, it's, a, it's a changing world when you see this RPD sort of household data put together with TAM people meter data, but it is something that we're going to move to in the future, um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it in all the countries through Southeast Asia. Quick quick comment. I mean, it, it's, um, it's reasonably easy to criticize uh, these two guys and, their, and what their companies do because, you know, they're, they're the incumbent measurement systems in a, in a whole number of markets worldwide because they provide particularly the currency for advertising to be traded on. They're in a very sticky, often reasonably secure situation. I mean, they sometimes, you know, get turfed out for someone else in particular circumstances. Like but it's in, a very, like in India. <laughs> it's a very sticky situation to be in, which means that they have, you know, historically been slow to change. I think that they will both become you know, increasingly pressured by, uh, you know, the forces of disruption around them to move faster, to respond faster to what's going on. I think the kind of, um, uh, you know, arguably the more transparent situation that you see within the online universe, uh, you know, and, and the speed of change that, that ad tech is bringing about in the online universe will put these guys under ever more increasing pressure. I think you have some very interesting startups coming through in, in, the, in the measurement space who are, again, sort of asking questions about how, how you should measure this stuff going forward. So, you know, I find really interesting, for example, there's a, a startup based in New Zealand called mm -hmm. Parrot Analytics, which is, you know, looking at all kinds of different um, data sets to understand demand for content. I think the, the key thing that uh, a lot of the online uh, world is moving towards is really, really powerful use of data about consumers and tying that to, uh, to their consumption habits on, on other areas. You know, I think these guys have got a long way to go yet in, in bringing data analytics to work to really get to that next stage. So I think you guys need to keep these guys under pressure <laughs> to adjust and move forward and keep up with the times. Nick looks like he has a strong point of view on that. <laughs> I think we've always felt under pressure to, to deliver robust measurement, I th and I think we've done that over time. Um, as Craig said earlier, one of the things that, that's needed now is more collaboration and more cooperation. Um, 
between us and, and the people that we collaborate with on that research in terms of tagging their content or introducing watermarking or all those sorts of things. So it's, it's a, it is a different dynamic now. Um, but we spend a lot of money on R&D and investment um, in trying to um, uh, respond to that pressure. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the things, one of the reasons why both companies have, have been able to respond is we both also, in a lot of countries, do the online measurement. So there already is this expertise um, within, within, uh, within Nielsen where we hold some of the bigger IAB contracts around the globe and we have been working around digital ad ratings and digital content ratings for a number of years. I think when it comes to startup companies like Parrot, I think one of the things that Nielsen has always been very good at, and that is transparency. Um, I think the new startup companies were happy to be pushed by them, but they do have to be transparent and not be a black box with their methodology. And I just think some of them haven't been as transparent as they probably could be. I don't disagree with that. I think just one aspect to add to multi-platform. I mean, it's something that's required and very important from a viewership or a consumption point of view. But I think some of the, the clients that I'm working with are struggling with one very interesting aspect is that the more transparency that you do provide, it sometimes tends to hurt. Because what happens is in markets where the CPMs are very low on the digital side, for example, and you try and club those audiences with your linear audiences, you end up discounting them. And therefore, that actually hurts ad sales in some cases. In other markets where the CPMs are more aligned, it works much better. But when there's that big gap, all that additional transparency may not be the best thing for ad sales. That, that, yeah, that's a very interesting perspective. Yeah. Uh, shifting a bit to emerging technologies. Uh, we know a while back in, in several panels, not unlike these a few years ago, we were talking about 3D uh, and how 3D is going to be the next big thing and it's going to change television and it's going to change sport and it's going to change broadcasting. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of resonance of exactly the same kind of discussions when it comes to virtual reality nowadays, uh, or even 4K content. Uh, and I know backstage, uh, Ed had some really interesting examples of <laughs> <laughs> how, how we should be harnessing I mean, look, uh, virtual I'll reality. With, I'll start with UHD, perhaps the more family friendly. <laughs> oh, go on, go on. Go for the VR <laughs> no, no, issue. No, 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 oh, look, okay, look. We're yep. always very, very, the TV industry in terms of the entertainment industry in general has always been a great technological driver to the mass audience. Um, you know, what we've seen with service providers using 4K and UHD, actually not just to offer, you know, better resolution, but to enhance the entire television experience available through their set-top box, usually necessitates some kind of set-top box upgrade. So they think, okay, let's sort out the UI. Let's integrate more third-party OTT services. Let's improve how the way that uh, the audience interacts with the remote control, with the content, with the entertainment, how we surface it, how we recommend it, how we recommend um, pieces of entertainment through the user interface. So I think it's a great time for the audiences in that respect. Um, and you know, we look at some of the most advanced television services such as Comcast X1 in the US. Um, we look at Sky Q in the UK. Uh, you know, some of these um, services have I think, fantastic functionality to, you know, to sort through and to present a more diverse and, uh, and larger and broader sources of content than ever before. You know, linear TV, recorded uh, content on your PVR, uh, terrestrial broadcaster catch-up services, third-party SVOD, third-party OTT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how do you present all of those in a single uh, customer experience? And I think we're seeing some pretty interesting things around that. We can go on to VR in a bit, but I thought it might be interesting to start with UHD. Sure. So, so 4K, 4K is happening whether the content industry likes it or not. It's happening from a consumer hardware push end, you know, in much the same way that 3D happened in a sense. But, you know, to right now, 25% of all global TV shipments are 4K, right? So 4K sets are moving into the market. One year ago, it's 15%. So the numbers are, are, are increasing significantly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Ed mentioned the pay TV guys uh, deploying 4K. You know, if you look back, you know, back to HD, going, so going from standard definition to high definition, that was led globally by pay TV operators. You know, the leading pay TV operators were the first to market. This time around, pay TV is second. Pay TV is too slow. The over-the-top services are the first to launch uh, 4K, the first to launch ultra-high definition. So today, right now, 
Amazon is making 4K available to more subscribers than all the world's pay TV operators put together, right? So it's now an OTT thing. They're leapfrogging the pay TV, uh, uh, you know, in terms of offering that 4K uh, position. And what always happens is when one person does it and it reaches some level of mass, the rest of the industry has to follow or they feel left behind. Sure. And it does have a customer perception, a big impact on customer perception. So I think you can expect reasonably that 4K will go. Yes, there are hardware costs involved. There is a cost of broadband involved as well, which is much higher. Uh, and therefore, it may not become a mass, mass, mass product in all markets. But in the more affluent markets, it can certainly become a large player. And I think you, for, from, a, from a measurement point of view, it, it doesn't make a lot of difference to us, us if it's HD or 4K. And I think it is very much the fact that manufacturers this time seem to be leading the charge um, because they are turning up the 4K TVs quicker than the content is available. So people will at home have a 4K TV and not even realise. And I think because it is so easily backward compatible, uh, the jump is certainly not as big from the old analogue uh, to HD, to digital, um, this is now just a natural progression and consumers are just going to sort of expect this. So sh sh let's talk VR then. Uh, <laughs> okay, I mean, we're very interested in VR at Ovum. Of course, we look at the head-mounted displays. We also look very, very closely um, at the availability of VR content. You know, we still see that sales of head-mounted displays are going to a relatively niche technology enthusiast segment. Um, the two entertainment genres, if you like, which seem to be making the most progress regarding um, producing VR content and the particular production challenges of virtual reality, in our view, are video gaming and adult entertainment. So um, <laughs> there, as, as, as we might observe, there might be quite a bit of overlap between the audiences for those two types of entertainment. But um, that would suggest to us that we're still at a relatively early stage in the evolution or the adoption curve uh, for VR in general. Um, and, there's, and, there's nothing to, and there's nothing to say, there's, there's, no, there's no working assumption we have that it will become a ma mass, o mass audience entertainment format. Uh, you know, we have to see a bit more evidence, um, in particular around content, that will make it so. I, I agree with Ed that we're at early stages, but we're, we're at a very, there's a lot of interesting uh, developments happening in these early stages. You know, I think it's always, um, it's always wise to some extent to follow the money and follow where the investment money is going. So, so this year, well, last year there was uh, about $750 million of VC money went into the VR sector alone. This year, the same amount will go in. So there's a lot of money going into the space. Uh, and you know, when that happens, interesting, interesting things will happen. The danger is that it gets overhyped too soon. Sure. So you know, that, that is always a danger when consumers get you know, disappointed early. But I see signs of very interesting things happen. So, you know, so, so uh, by 2020, we expect the value of VR content to be over three billion in terms of consumer sales. Now, mm. that's a, a, a significant number, but it's also a modest number mm. in the global entertainment yeah. market. Yeah. And we are far from as bullish as many other uh, a analysts out there. But you know, it is interesting in terms of you know new business models, which I think it, you know is what we should be kind of looking, looking to uh, see emerge. You know, there are there's lots of experimentation. So even yesterday, um, you know, a company called Yumi uh, uh, announced an ad format based around 360 degree video experience. So an immersive way of interacting with ad uh, with advertising content. You know, I think you're going to see a lot of experimentation, a lot of stuff being thrown against the wall to see what sticks. But it will be a very interesting space. So, yes, overhyped. It won't be as big as many think. It won't be as big as many analysts forecast. But it will be a very interesting space. I see interesting content actually happening. 
outside of games and outside of adult content. You know, there's some very interesting video content coming through. Um, you know, some very interesting, uh, um, you know, creative possibilities. So don't expect too much too soon would be my own message. Yeah, you know, it, it will be interesting to see how it develops. It, it reminds me a little bit of um, when interactive options came in on, on pay TV platforms and Red Button and all that sort of stuff. And through some of our RPD services, we did quite a bit of measurement around that. And actually, the take up of that, of all of those options, and it may be different this time around because of the quality and whatever, but the take up of some of those options didn't, didn't meet the hype that, would, that had been put forward, actually. And some of those services then got dropped over time. So it will be interesting. And I, and I think one of the one of the issues that it, the industry is going to struggle with is people had a bad experience early on. People put on that bad set of headsets, they got there, they got dizzy, they got giddy. It just didn't work for them, and they're asking themselves, could I watch long-form content on this type of platform? Um, but anyone that has a 12 to 18-year-old uh, child in the house knows that they want those uh, virtual reality goggles for their new PS4 for Christmas. Um, <laughs> there, there is a lot of pressure. So I think, I think the gaming industry, you walk into any game store, certainly there, um, Samsung seems to be giving them away with just about any phone you buy. Yeah. Um, so the industry is certainly trying to push it. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be as big as the industry's hyping it at the moment, but there will certainly be a large niche out there, and then working out how we can monetize uh, these people with advertising. I just want to go back to what Ashish was mentioning earlier about, so to, so to move away from emerging technologies, uh, to what Ashish was mentioning earlier about low CPMs, right, in some of the markets, and I think that's pretty, especially on digital, and that's pretty much a reality for, for a lot of the emerging markets in Southeast Asia, in India, for example. What, what's therefore, your outlook for award services, given that these are also markets which are not real, which don't have a huge propensity to pay for content necessarily, if they pay at all. Uh, so, what's what's really the outlook for award? Is there is there a way of making that model work in spite of CPMs being so low? Yeah, I think there are two three things which uh, content producers must look to do. The first, I think we discussed already, was bundling with broadband. Uh, I think that is absolutely critical to get any kind of mass going. Without that, I don't think that the uptake will ever get more than a very niche uptake, especially in countries where digital is quite nascent. Uh, the second thing really is about moving into a transaction model. I think the days are gone when you can say, that's my target audience. I mean, that's all nice to have, but at the end of the day, if you own a certain set of audiences uh, as a content company and not a broadcaster, then you need to figure out what else those audiences need and go after those audiences. Kind of like what uh, Axel Springer has done with many of their publications in Europe, uh, what, the, what the New York Times has now started doing, and certainly what the Times of India has started doing, where they've actually taken a consumer through his entire lifestyle. They said, okay, first we'll get you educated, then we'll get you a car, we'll get you married, we'll get you a home. You know, it's, it's an end-to-end -end kind of thing, and they're building that community of, uh, uh, of readers and then going after their various needs out there. So I think a transaction model uh, works very well uh, out there. And I think the last bit is what I firmly believe will never change, which is content is king. Uh, I think there's got to be some more flexibility. You can't just have a model which says pay $8 up front, or you can't have another model which says take it all for free. Both of them are devastating. One will never get big. Uh, the other one will never make you money. But I think once you've got someone hooked onto it, say a person has watched four or five episodes of Game of Thrones, he's not going to give up on Game of Thrones, right? He'll be more willing to pay. It won't even feel like an expenditure for that person. So if we can get to those kind of models uh, of monetization, I think there's a much larger scope. An overarching umbrella over that is piracy management. I think that's going to kill most business plans. It's a very, very serious issue. We've estimated that about 15% of the industry revenues are being lost to piracy. With the growth of broadband, of good quality broadband, we see that going as high as 25%. So that's really going to become one of the biggest issues right now. How to handle that is something which I think you've got to work with legislation. You've got to work with enforcement to make it happen. But if that doesn't work, I don't think any model will work uh, in some of these markets. 
And, I, and Prem, I think with um, advertiser-supported uh, video on demand, I think a lot of broadcasters are already doing it today with their catch-up services. Mm -hmm. We're seeing lots of lo lots of um, broadcasters putting their catch-up services and retailing the commercials, doing less commercials to give sort of the user an experience where they feel that they're they're getting away with something because they're watching this with a less commercial load, but they don't realise that commercials are more targeted. So I think the the AVOD will come around um, through this way, through uh, more catch-up services, more structured catch-up services. I, I agree with that entirely. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that broadcasters often been slow to do is to, uh, you know, is have their, their um, sales teams integrated across the new platforms and the traditional business, right? So, you know, we've, we saw originally a lot of the sales teams being, you know, the digital sales team and the traditional business. You have to really integrate across those businesses, really run effectively across all of the outlets that you have. And, you know, catch up is, you know, is, is a case in point. And as we can move to apply better ad tech towards that catch up, and as you say, get, um, you know, more targeted, uh, and therefore higher value um, uh, CPMs on those platforms, you know, that, that has to be the way forward. But, you know, AVOD is, is about more than just, just broadcaster and catch up, you know, the whole new world of, of other digital platforms out there that, that, you know, we talked about earlier with, you know, with, with YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, you know, all kinds of different content works. But again, it, it's about, the quality of content, as you said. So, you know, you look at the CPMs that Vivo gets mm -hmm. across YouTube, mm -hmm. they are TV-like mm -hmm. CPMs on YouTube. So it's the, it's the content. I think it's, it's time to actually get the broadcasters to move <coughs> towards an MPN kind of existence. Mm -hmm. And they should not really worry about being broadcasters, but more about saying, how can I take my content across as many possible platforms? out there and therefore yes some platforms will be more remunerative and some will be less but on an aggregate it's all about increasing reach once you do that i think you've won the game and you don't really need to look at each platform independently but more as an aggregation of all the viewership and all the revenues that you can generate great uh, we'd love to go on with with a lot more stuff but i think we've pretty much run out of time uh, so thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time out. I think it's been really interesting, and hopefully we've set the tone for, for really for the next four days. And thank you to all of you for being here as well. Thank you.